Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, thank you for giving us this time this evening to consider at length your word expressed by your servant, St. Mark. Let us pray to glean whatever insights you have for us tonight through prayerful contemplation of his writing. St. Mark, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So as I mentioned last week, three major themes of the Gospel of Mark are Jesus as the Messiah, the kingdom of God, and the nature of discipleship. So I'm going to give uh, three talks this evening, again with those, uh, each talk focusing primarily on one of those themes. So this is a really interesting section of the Gospel of Mark. A lot happened. There was a lot going on. And we're going to unpack it fairly slowly. We're going to begin by thinking about what we have learned about Jesus in these four chapters. So the confession of Peter, which we just heard, is in many ways the culmination of everything that's happened in the Gospel of Mark up to this point. As Jesus has traveled from place to place, preached, healed, expelled demons, and so forth, uh, stilled raging waters of the storm, it all comes back to, well, who is he? It's a question asked of many. And Peter answered that he is the Christ, the Messiah. So when we think about Jesus as the Messiah, and we think about this in light of his teaching about the kingdom of God throughout this section, it's an opportunity to think about how we commemorate Christ as the king of the kingdom. And that's, of course, something that we have in our liturgy. The 34th Sunday is Christ the king. And a lot of what it means for, be, for Christ to be the king, we get um, information about in these chapters. And the first thing I want to emphasize about the kingship of Christ is that in general, when you think about kingship and kingdoms and the like, we might instinctively think of them as territorial. So the, the king of England, his territory is, you know, England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and, and so forth. But that's not really the essence of kingship. The essence of kingship has to do with the mutual responsibilities of the ruler and the subjects, actually. So if we first think about the responsibilities of the subjects to the king, there's certainly a notion of responsibility of following, obedience, good citizenship, and so forth. But this isn't a one-way street. Now, especially in the ancient world, and at times even in the modern world, to be honest, rulers sometimes do evidence the idea of, I'm in charge, I'm the boss, People just need to do what I say. Certainly we had that idea in the Rome of the time period we're looking at, and especially with Herod, and we're going to talk about that in some more detail as we go. But that's not really of the essence of kingship. Ultimately, the only reason for anybody to be a king is to protect his subjects from adversaries. That's the fundamental responsibility of a king. Without fulfilling that responsibility, a king is merely a tyrant and nothing more. Jesus, perfect, perfect man, sinless man, of course is exactly the kind of king who first and foremost takes as his responsibility the protection of his subjects from adversaries. And we're going to ponder the nature of those adversaries in a moment. But I want to begin first by actually pondering the figure of Herod for a moment 
as an example of king as tyrant because Mark gives us a tremendous amount of detail about Herod in the passage about the death of John the Baptist. Let's examine what happened. So uh, Herod had sent and seized John the Baptist and bound him in prison for the sake of his wife, uh, or for Herodias, who had originally been his brother's wife, but he had subsequently married her. John the Baptist had told Herod, it's not lawful for you to marry her. So Herod's response, king as tyrant, put John in prison. But there are a lot of other interesting details here. For instance, Herod feared John knowing that he was a righteous and holy man and kept him safe. When he heard him, when Herod listened to John, he was perplexed and yet he heard him gladly. So it's almost like you can see Herod being on the verge of manifesting discipleship. He's almost there. He's ready to listen. He's curious. He wants to hear more about what John has to say in spite of the fact that John has been castigating him publicly for his sins. So for Herod to get to this point, his soul was getting somewhere. It was moving somewhere. But then something else happens. So um, Herodias' daughter came in and danced. She pleased Herod and his guests. So not to put too fine a point on this, but Mark here is being a little guarded with his language in terms of representing what actually happened. The implication here is that Herodias' daughter was performing some kind of erotic dance designed to arouse the lust of those who were beholding her. And a further clue of this comes from the slightly cryptic statement, whatever you ask me I will give you, even half of my kingdom. So let's think about for a moment what half of my kingdom means. Herod is saying, I would, you know, I'll give you whatever you want. I would even be more than happy to make you my wife too. It was a proposition for him to say that. It's not like he was going to delegate half the kingdom to her. He was making a, a sexual proposition there. The point of this being, Herod, although he was starting to get a little bit of a glimmer of a spiritual focus is fundamentally a prisoner of his sins, of his lust in particular at this point. And his lust then leads him to murder because the demand that she makes is for the head of John the Baptist. So again, we're faced with king, subject, responsibilities, and in the end he proves to be a tyrant, in fact. Now, part perhaps of why Mark uh, dwelt at such length on Herod was to illustrate the earthly model of kingship with which the average dweller of the Roman Empire at the time had to deal with, had to confront. The kingship of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God, is something of an entirely different character. And so when we think in particular about the responsibility of a king to protect his subjects from adversaries, we see many, many examples of this on the part of Jesus throughout this passage. Again, contrasted with Herod, where Herod became the adversary of the people he had a responsibility to protect. John the Baptist was his subject. Protect him in the end, he did not. So if we look back at chapter 4, 
when Jesus calms the storm on the sea, there's a lot of value in seeing the transition from the end of chapter 4 to the start of chapter 5. I'll here mention parenthetically, perhaps, that the chapter-verse divisions of the Bible were certainly not part of the original text. It's more of a medieval thing that was introduced simply to make it easier to find passages in the Bible. But the reason I highlight it here is that Mark, in composing this, would not have had any kind of natural break between the end of chapter 4 and the start of chapter 5. Those are a continuous narrative. So if we look back on Jesus uh, and the storm, in verse, chapter 4, verse 39, we have Jesus awoke and rebuked the wind. And so this word rebuke is the same word that he uses or that Mark uses to designate what happens in an exorcism. So Jesus calms the storm the same way he casts out demons. It's the same term. The implication being, this was not a natural storm. This was some kind of primeval evil force interfering with his ministry. And then when we get into chapter 5, we see why. As I start reading the beginning of chapter 5, I feel like I am watching, I am reading an extremely vivid description of a scene out of a horror movie. Think about it for the moment. You've got this guy possessed by demons. He's been chained up. He breaks the chains. There are crypts. It's spooky. It's nuts. And it's been anticipated by the demonic force of the storm that anticipated it. So what we have to keep in mind here, right, is Jesus sort of tells the disciples, let's cross the other side. And the disciples are like, well, okay, he's the boss. But Jesus doesn't do these things without a reason or a purpose. The purpose of crossing the sea was to heal this man, this demoniac to cast out that demon. And the forces of evil knew that. So Jesus now, as king, is protecting his subjects from the adversaries. He protects the disciples in the end from the storm, even though they had their doubts, admittedly. And now he's coming to save the demoniac as well. He made the trip all the way across the lake solely for that purpose. And there are going to be some other subtle purposes that we're going to see as we continue to explore it. But that was the deepest, most fundamental reason that he crossed. To defend his people against their adversaries. Who else, what else are adversaries of the kingdom of God? If we look ahead... To chapter 7 now, uh, if we look at verses 21 to 23, we have the culmination of the discourse between Jesus and the Pharisees about this issue of washing of cups and utensils and the like. Don't get the wrong idea. Before my kids go to the dinner table, I do indeed want them to wash up. But what had happened at this point was that the Pharisees and many of those who followed them had gotten so caught up in the ritual that they hadn't really thought through, why are we doing this? It was more of just kind of a, well, if we follow all these rules, everything is fine. But Jesus expounds on the fact that that's not really where their hearts were. And when he's talking to the disciples here, it's a very interesting passage because uh, there's perhaps no nice way to say this. Let's just repeat what Mark says. Do you not see that whatever goes into a man from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not in his heart but his stomach and so passes on? Garbage in, garbage out. Crap comes in, crap goes out. That's basically what he's saying right here. 
We don't you like to think of it that way, but, but Jesus could be very blunt. And that, that's, that's exactly what he's doing here. What comes out of a man is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a man. Now, right here, Jesus is giving focus to his mission. Because remember, at the beginning of chapter 1, what are the first words out? The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel, right? And so here Jesus is clarifying, here's a helpful list of what you need to be repenting from. The list as such is not a novelty. That content is largely found in the commandments and the like. But people had fallen asleep about it. They weren't paying attention to it. They were focusing on rituals and not on the inner cleansing of their hearts. And that's another adversary Jesus has come to confront. Our own temptations, our own tendencies to evil, he has come to confront and to abjure through the forgiveness of sins. Ultimately, we are far more in danger from our own sins than we are from demons and evil forces and the like. And that is a chief adversary that Jesus has come to expel. Our heroes, the disciples here, are not exempt from these temptations either, right? So, given the ancient tradition that Peter was a primary source for Mark's material, in a way, you can see the commentary on the situation with the apostles as Peter's own examination of conscience in retrospect, looking back on all of this from what he knew. Like if you look at 652, they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Jesus comes to soften the hardened heart. It doesn't always happen immediately. But Jesus is persistent, and that is how the hearts of the disciples were eventually in the fullness of time softened. They continue to struggle. If we look, at, for instance, at 817, this is the passage about the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear. They're being stubborn. Why? Because they're attached to a particular way of thinking about Jesus, and a particular set of expectations about Jesus. And Jesus has to lead them slowly, and given a passage like this, with quite literal divine patience to a better place. And finally, 831 to 33 is his criticism of Peter. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. So it's the same word rebuke again. Peter rebuking Jesus for saying this is Peter effectively saying only someone possessed by a devil would be saying only would be saying that you would have to be killed. Peter is so attached to a particular idea about Jesus that Jesus has to give him some rather sharp talk to wake up turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not on the side of God, but of men. So he said something that was pretty harsh to Peter in response to the fact that Peter, in his own sin, was so stuck on a particular way of handling things 
that he rejected the teaching of Jesus. Again, Jesus, divine patience. Peter turned around, worked out a little bit better, perhaps, than, than with Herod. And indeed, not all is ill with the disciples, even in these chapters. And here I want to highlight chapter 7, especially verses 7 through 13. He said to them, whoops, wrong one. Is that right? I think I have the wrong chapter. That was chapter 6, verses 7 to 13. So typo in the handout, chapter 6. That one apparently escaped my proofreading. My apologies. So, chapter 6. He called to them the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. So again, Christ as the king is sending out his servants in a very different way than an earthly king. No earthly king would be sending his servants with so little in material terms. Now, why is he doing that? It's because his kingdom is not a material thing. They don't need anything material to exercise the authority that the king is delegating to them to carry out. So they went out and preached that men should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. So let's think about the significance of these activities that they were undertaking. Preaching repentance, casting out demons, and healing are the precise hallmarks of Jesus' own ministry up to this point. So now, Jesus, the king, appoints his servants to carry on his ministry outside of his presence. So the kingdom is not even limited to the presence of Jesus. He has servants who bring it with them. And so right here, we have a wonderful glimpse of the plan that Jesus had for the Catholic Church. He wasn't going to leave us on our own. The apostles continued to carry out his ministry, and their successors to this day continue it. Look at some of these details. They anointed with oil many that were sick. Right there, it's like the institution of the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. And as we know in the catechism, and as Jesus emphasizes throughout his ministry, the true deep healing he brings is the healing of forgiveness from sin. And that is the primary effect of the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. And our priests continue to use oil in that sacrament because they are following the instructions of Jesus that we see right here in the Gospel of Mark, as a matter of fact. And this applies as well to the idea of baptism. The ceremonial washing we see at the start of chapter 7 anticipates the true washing of sin that baptism provides. So there's an analogy between traditional Jewish purification rituals as anticipating what Christ would bring. That becomes even more sharper in focus with the ministry of John the Baptist at the start of the Gospel of Mark. He baptizes with water, but then he proclaims, but one is coming after me who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And ultimately, that too will be part of the mission 
entrusted by the king to his servants. So in sum, especially in this section of the gospel, what we have is, in a sense, an implementation of the kingdom of God. He's been preaching it early on. Now he's really starting to carry it out. And we're going to explore that in a lot more detail as, as we continue through our study this evening. For now, I'm going to invite you all to take five minutes of uh, silent uh, prayer time and reflection time to consider either or both of these two reflection questions, or really any other reflection that occurred to you from your listening to these chapters. First, which of the evils that Jesus listed as coming from within the heart of man represents for you right now your greatest spiritual challenge? What is it that Jesus is most immediately calling you to overcome? And secondly, ponder, how might Jesus be calling you to confront adversaries of the kingdom of God? Bearing in mind, of course, that the weapons that the servants of Jesus use are prayer, fasting, almsgiving, and the other great works that he calls us to. Let's go ahead and ponder those things for the next five minutes, and then we'll look, then I'll begin the second presentation.